Now the time has come for us to look at uh, democracy in the digital era and to listen to another important thinker. You know, so Our guest speaker is one of the greatest thinkers on earth. You all know him. He's the author of books such as Political for, for the Perplex, uh, Politics in Times of uh, indignity, Indignation, and more recently, a theory of uh, complex democracy with ideas that only a philosopher can have. And so we're going to listen to someone who lives philosophy and how it's integrated in the evolution, technology, digitalization. He's a teacher of political and of, uh, social um, philosophy at the University of the Basque Country. And he has a wonderful sentence. He says that doubts had made him optimistic. He's an optimist because there's one single reason. Pessimists have to be very sure of themselves, and he's not. He continues to doubt. That's why he's optimistic. It's a pleasure and a privilege to count on Professor Daniel Inerariti. Well, the, the attempt to, to replace uh, politics with activities that resemble it, administration, knowledge, uh, technology, has been pursued for, for a long time. The recourse to experts or to technology, its evaluation in economic uh, categories or as a procurer of, of social order, seem more promising that, than the old politics, ideological and sudden, risky and inaccurate. The temptation to leave behind this period of, of ideological fury and imprecision is today driven by the techniques that accompany artificial intelligence, algorithmic decision-making, data analytics, and automation. This colonization begins, in my view, with an epistemic confusion whereby ways of thinking that make perfect sense in one domain and are admired for their precision and are extrapolated to others where they can only produce distortion of reality. Algorithmic accuracy becomes unfairness when it abandons its instrumental character and embeds with its logic, the space in which the values and goals of society are to be decided on the basis of political and democratic criteria. Algorithmic governance seeks to reintroduce into democratic society that reliable, exact, and incontrovertible judgment that experts want represented, and that political pluralism was reluctant to accept. Then, as now, democratic balance is achieved by confronting expert knowledge with public criticism and auditing algorithms with criteria uh, that include in automatic decision-making systems, a complete vision of the political community. It makes no sense for us to make the same mistake with algorithmic uh, governance that we were reluctant to make in the face of technocratic seduction. The defense of political logic against its colonization involves correctly identifying what makes politics so peculiar against those who seek to invade it. And its first uh, characterization is of an epistemological nature. Politics is an activity that does not exercise a type of linear and deductive reasoning that manages situations of special uh, ambiguity that has to decide in the midst of great uncertainty and contingency. This peculiarity distinguishes it from algorithmic logic, which demands clarity, objectivity, and precision. Herein lie the real limits of any algorithmic treatment of political affairs, but also, that's very important, the foundation of democracy. That we organize society democratically is not a normative concession, but above all, an intelligent consequence of the experience that fundamental issues concerning public life have to be decided by means of instruments that are capable of managing a high degree of uncertainty. 
democratic concerns, guaranteeing pluralism, minimizing imposition, enable the revision of agreements. These democratic concerns are first and foremost epistemological strategies. We do all this to protect ourselves from error and to make the right decision more likely. The algorithmization of policy decisions, while a great tool for dealing with certain forms of complexity, primarily those requiring data or precision in the, in the measurement or preferences, and, or preferences and, and impacts, is very clumsy in relation to other forms of complexity stemming from the ambiguous and contingent nature of political situations. The question of the suitability of artificial intelligence to take on a political role goes back to an earlier consideration of which uh, logic is more appropriate to politics in a democratic society and how to balance them. The reductionism of calculation versus reflexive pluralism. We protect democracy to the same extent that we protect a proper space for the management of issues that we that are not resolved by deductive logic, that are ambiguous, uncertain, and contingent. When we resist the depoliticization that would mean dealing with them with the instruments that are only capable when dealing with problems that are characterized by the opposite. The first difference between humans and machines lies in the type of reasoning from which policy decisions are made versus how algorithmic decision-making works. Algorithms decide with relative ease when it comes to if-then decision trees, where the relationship between an input and an output output is, is clear. The knowledge of uh, artificial uh, intelligence refers to an objective world, reducible to binary categories and calculable. The world is for it a set of facts that can be logically deduced from concrete rules and computationally modeled. From the epistemological point of view, the processing of information follows a model of logical computation. The computation of artificial intelligence does not focus on the context of the input, its specificity, but on the correctness of the logical operations. In this way, the issues it handles are separated from their particular context and considered as isolated phenomena, so that the logical coherence of the system is more important than the plural possibilities of interpretation of the situation. Algorithms work with zero and one logic, which is the opposite of the ambiguity. When algorithms work with categories of likelihood, they end up surrendering to binary answers because only such answers are computable according to objective categories. Anything that, that is fuzzy, undefined, or imprecise has a difficult treatment in binary logic. Algorithms are appropriate for dealing with definite and quantifiable circumstances, but incapable of asking about meaning or validity. The only way to correct this bias is to encourage an assessment framework in which other magnitudes, such as common sense, empathy, deviance, deviance or quality are considered. If humans routinely navigate situations of ambiguity, it is because we take the context into account, something that is difficult for an algorithm or data analytics to capture. Anything that modulates or automates involves a simplification that uh, ignores a context. The success of the mass production industry of Fordism, for example, was due to standardization. But such organizations are suboptimal when there are activities that cannot be understood and organized through standardization. 
An example of this in the current digital environment are recommendations that uh, respond to our spontaneous uh, consumption and do not identify what our uh, preferences might be in the long term. Or more uh, generally, data obtained in one context, for instance, consumption preferences that are used in a quite different one, political decision. Digital rationality does not tolerate the variety and ambiguity of social phenomena, but reduces them to a number from which it deduces structures and causalities. This is a reduction of complexity through a reduction of modes of knowledge. Humans, on the other hand, reason incredibly accurately in the midst of situations of ambiguity, confusion, and uncertainty. Humans and societies have to make many of uh, our decisions in the middle of ambiguity and uncertainty. In this situation, it is uncomfortable. We should, if this situation is uncomfortable, we should also bear in mind that we owe our pluralism to it so that a forced reduction of this diversity would imply limiting the diversity of opinions and values that characterizes a democratic society. Algorithmic procedures operate with a degree of accuracy that contrasts with the management of uncertainty that's, that is inherent to politics. Much of the relevance or inappropriateness of political decisions, more than by technical, logical, or moral criteria, is determined by a political specificity that has to do with contextual factors, criteria of opportunity, balances, and trans transactions. Rarely does politics decide with binary categories, good versus bad, truth versus falsehood. Or if one prefers, the most specific aspect of politics is to decide when these resounding criteria have already taken into account and the most important thing has yet to be decided. Algorithmic procedures serve to reduce complexity but do not seem likely to eliminate absolutely the uncertainty in which a good part of political decisions are taken, thus disappointing their promises of objectivity to the relief of those who feared the end of political pluralism. Politics appears where, where we know everything that could be known, and it is still not entirely clear what should be done. A decision is then taken as well informed as uh, possible, but it's still a decision that is not crushing, contestable, and revisible. Artificial intelligence procedures cannot extend, exempt us from this decision. There is politics where, despite all the sophistication of the calculations, we are finally forced to make a decision that is neither preceded by overwhelming reasons nor driven by infallible technologies. All processes of technification tend to model or automate in such a way that the human factor become less uh, relevant. Humans have, to, have not stopped dreaming of the perfect technology of justice, to, to, to quote the lesson. But neither we have, have we stop experiencing the burden of having our decisions bear the ultimate responsibility for making society fair. Contemporary society require a great mobilization of knowledge, more accurate analytical tools are, and more efficient administration. It is highly debatable whether algorithms and automation can take over the entire decision-making process, but even if they can, in a democracy, the correctness of decisions cannot be established without asserting a political logic whose legitimacy 
ultimately rests on criteria of legitimacy. A democracy procedure um, better decisions than its alternative models, but owes its ultimate legitimacy not to the goodness of its decisions, but to the popular authorizations behind those decisions. The inevitability of deciding is the ultimate justification for democracy as a form of government in which the lay people have the last word over the experts. There seems to be no, no device today, either analog or digital, that completely relieves us of this need to decide. There are occasions when evidence puts an end to a political controversy, but more often than not, even propositions with aspiration of scientific evidence are confronted with other supposed evidence and different epistemic modalities are asserted in political debates. The appeal to the neutrality of procedures or the objectivity of authoritative expert uh, opinions does not make the moment of political decision unnecessary. Why? Because politics is almost never perceived by overwhelming decisions, uh, reasons, sorry. Politics is the kind of decision we make when, even after a long process of deliberation and preceded by all the objective analysis available to us, the optimal choice is still not entirely clear. Whoever does not uh, understand this will interpret politics as arbitrary and opportunistic and will be especially uh, seduced by any promise of accuracy formulated by, by experts, machines, or algorithms, but will not have understood what politics is about, especially what politics in a democratic society is about. A human world, I like to say, has to be a ne negotiable world. The democratic problem of artificial intelligence is due to its way of thinking, to the fact that it produces epistemic biodiversity. The algorithmic procedures erode the assumptions on which democratic pluralism, the diversity of uh, logics and interpretations of reality is based. Political pluralism is first and foremost an epistemological pluralism. Politics must respect evidence, of course, but when it is assumed that there are only facts and objectivities that do not require any interpretation, democracy is meaningless. Algorithmic uh, precision, like expert knowledge, when presented um, as undisputable objectivities, with its supposedly de-ideologized uh, procedures collides with the epistemic and normative pluralism of democratic societies. The compatibility of the democracy and, and artificial intelligence depends on their politicization, that is, on their insertion into broader context in which we do with algorithms what modern democratic revolutions did with power, divide and problematize it, expose it to contestation and critique. If we do not accept that someone wills undisputed political power, then equally, when algorithmic procedures are introduced into government, we must establish the spaces and modes that allow for their contestation. The increasing technification of political affairs must be counterbalanced by a corresponding politicization of technical procedures. When we talk about democracy, the key issue is to protect pluralism. Politics is a way of organizing social co coexistence that allows for diverse answers to an open set of questions. 
if we give this political space a digital format, it could be reasonable to think that every machine learning system is a kind of parliament in which the training data represent some larger electorate. And as in any democracy, it is crucial to ensure that everyone gets a vote. Not only there are there parliaments where our political representatives sit, there must, must also be parliaments for them to discuss data and artifacts. This is what we are meant when we talk about politicizing artifacts. Democracy in the digital age is impossible without an explicit thema thematization of technologies. Algorithms always involve choices between competing values that, that, that cannot, be, cannot be made on purely technical grounds and require extensive public deliberation. The fairness of algorithm must be understood as a political question and resolved politically. That's, it is not about optimizing or improving algorithmic techniques, but about considering and accommodating diverse conflicting interests in a society. A democracy is a political system that does not definitively close off the possibilities for reflection and change of institutionalized realities. Democracy is, in this sense, a political system that uh, institutionalizes the lack of absolute certainty, that values and contingency, uh, the contingency of the social order, where any administrative procedure, technological practice, or appeal to scientific truths can be politicized. In a democracy, uncertainty is only punctually neutralized always returning to the horizon of questioning and reflexivity in which it usually lives. I come to my end. Politicization is, always involves uh, recognizing the constructive nature of political differences, but not renouncing, by not, by not renouncing to the, the epistemological advantages of institutionalized disagreement, not only between humans, but also between ourselves and our artifacts. We could even, even think of the metaphor of a parliament of artifacts, because there is not just one single technology, but a variety of technologies that assert different procedures and principles. It is in this parliament of artifacts that we would have to weigh and balance technological justifications, the validity of data, the biases of algorithms, the usefulness of automation in a similar way as we do with our ideological and interest differences in classical parliamentary institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Professor Daniel Inerarity, where he's led us with, left us with a lot of ideas. For the next 20 minutes, we're going to use some of his ideas uh, to talk. So we have a um, uh, university professor, Egra, um, Miguel Polares Maduro, Polares Maduro, Graça Fonseca. So, who's, who's Graça Fonseca, sociologist and politician. First of all, welcome. So, I saw... I can start with a question, a million dollar question. So, democracy was improved or worsened? with the excess of technology and the way technology is being used. I mean, first of all, we, we think that we all have a voice, we all have access to this. Is this good? Or, on the other hand, it makes things more complicated. Thank you very 
much. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. I mean, the, you, could, you can answer both ways. I could, maybe I get way better, and maybe there are more risks. We had uh, Professor Nariti, who has uh, helped me uh, politically for many years. And uh, so now, we, we, thanks to him, we know what we're doing a little bit better. And so in this, uh, uh, his latest book, he starts by saying something uh, that is uh, some appears uh, contradictory, he says, the greatest threat to democracy is simplicity, which says everything about the context in which we live this morning. Uh, we've heard about the complexity of the time we live in. I mean, time is uh, uh, much more complex than the time of our grandparents. I mean, the compression of time. And so the, the technologies... Uh, uh, the, the increase in, uh, in everything, uh, climate change, globalization, uh, volatility, uh, that uh, Dr. Professor Nerichi talks about a lot. Uh, things last for a very short period of time. Uh, we live in societies um, that... What we, that we live where we live a lot, but we quickly forget what we have lived. It's, it's very intense, but it lasts for a very short time. And to human attention, that is everything that it can uh, retain. And to that exercise of going home, and what do we remember of uh, our day? Probably nothing. Now, our uh, human capacity today is totally uh, exhausted, and some doctors say that uh, they receive 10,000 to 40,000 contents a day. It is um, impossible to uh, um, take in all this information. This is the context that uh, democracies live in. It is very different from a couple of centuries ago, but even so, this uh, ephemeral, this uh, uh, speed ends up by having a dimension in uh, an importance in democracy, and so that is in terms of who can uh, destroy the power of a politician today. I mean, it seems to be a benching, but a, a blessing, but then it's a, a, a weapon. Everything is exponential. Everything is exponential, and the uh, human capacity in our brain it does not to do well with exponential. And this is one of the major challenges that we have. And this is something that we talked about this morning. I mean, this morning I heard the, the word uh, future a lot, and then uh, the future associated with the medium term. There is no future and medium. The term the future doesn't exist, the future is today. And this never happened before, which means, uh, once again, by going back to what uh, Professor Indariti says, we have to bring the future into our uh, political ecosystem. And uh, we have to have. Uh, a couple of years ago, I talked about, about the proposal of the Ministry of the Future to 2016, which. Uh, uh, who was original. I mean, uh, the countries in the north have already done it. Uh, the, we have to understand that Wales, for example, has done this. We have to realise that the future is not medium term. Uh, the future is now. Uh, where the change has uh, shown us that uh, it is tomorrow. The political climate and people, politicians, have to be uh, have to learn about the future, and we we have to think about our capacity to uh, react. Just one last word: a uh, pandemic has shown something that we didn't we had never thought about from one day to another. Uh, thousands of millions of people uh, had to stay at home. And thousands of millions of people accept uh, to be subject to tests, uh, mid uh, temperature measurements, uh, uh, with uh, with restrictions to their uh, fr freedoms, and uh, hundreds and millions of uh, companies stopped working and can't stop working. And what does it mean? Uh, we react to the risk of today, but we're we don't do this in terms of the risk of tomorrow. So, Miguel, let's go back to the idea of a democracy versus technology, the idea that each one of us can have uh, access uh, uh, to, and to, to an influence that uh, I didn't have a couple of years ago. How do we contradict these negative effects? And we know that many democracies end up by just uh, a cold democracy, and te technology can help this. This is a democracy, uh, sort of an intermediate 
mediated democracy, that is the role that many people who intermediated uh, the, uh, the, 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 the people and power, and uh, it was at, at trade unions or other organizations. On the other hand, it's very appealing, the idea that we can uh, participate in the decisions directly, and uh, we can obtain information, we can scrutinize in a more constant, permanent and uh, quick way. On the other hand, the reality is that this alters the uh, processes, political decision-making processes, and sometimes we deceive ourselves. And can give you an example of how things change. It's not from politics. Uh, in the past, we'd go to the doctor. The doctor would make a diagnosis. He prescribed medication. We'd go to the pharmacy. And, to, and nowadays, people go to uh, the doctor. He makes a diagnosis. And then they go to the people go home, go to the Google to see whether the doctor is right, whether his diagnosis is right. So a very, access, a very easy access to information creates a false idea in us that this information is uh, translated into knowledge. That is, we will, that gives us the idea that we uh, will have the same degree of knowledge than, as the doctor. They believe more than uh, face, they believe more in Facebook and Google than an expert. That is the publish, what I call the publishers of uh, democracy. It's, for example, journalists where the uh, publishers of our public space. Now they're being replaced by algorithms which define the information that we received, uh, received first of all. And biased, uh, because algorithms have editorial criteria which are different from journalism. Now they have editorial criteria, among others, uh, that is by being guided by uh, monetization objectives and creating business models associated with social platforms. They're going to give uh, information that reproduces, confirms, uh, and reinforces our, pre our biases, our ideas, and creates a great, greater polarization, for example. Now, this is one of the difficulties. This. Uh, I know the so when press the press was made the the, the world uh, developed it was easy to exchange uh, information and knowledge and then it uh, grew and was developed now the uh, uh, knowledge. The, the dissemination of knowledge uh, facilitates the uh, dissemination of false knowledge as well. And so we have to think of the, the volume and the of information and it alters the nature of communication and the nature of how we formulate knowledge and based on this knowledge how we create political preferences. This is one of the most important alterations and one of the greatest challenges that we have. It's very proper. I mean, we can scrutinize governments more easily, but there are many risks on the other hand. Agrasso. And so look, look at this idea again. So there are two former ministers with me here. So we have uh, that is through the social networks. What does ha what happens through the social networks that condition you? How do you protect yourself against this avalanche? Um, it's, uh, it's always, you say, okay, that is on the social network. So the, this is what happening. It's like viral. So how do you avoid this? In order to continue doing the necessary democratic uh, uh, work. Now, the, what the greatest challenge that we have today is uh, understanding. Because the gatekeepers have been removed, uh, specialists, etc. On the one hand, it's good. That is that when we can. You, you can note, note the, the power that we have as a, a politician, a journalist, a citizen, a business person has increased greatly. Now, the, today, the one person's ability, uh, one can uh, change parts. So the, the idea of the megaphone is dangerous because uh, one, I can give you an example. There can be the, it can be the, I mean, the, the prime minister or the, the head of a terrorist government. And so these are the major challenges that we have. The, that is to communicate. So the, Miguel talked about uh, uh, 
uh, information and knowledge. We have to transfer for, uh, transform information into knowledge, and that is in order to be able to show us what we want to convey as uh, information. And then we have a dramatic problem of uh, communication because when a while ago, when I was saying that we are. Uh, exposed to contents, a huge number of content means that we can't communicate, even in social networks, even in studies nowadays that say how long how extensive Twitter. So, if we make a comparison over a couple of years, it, the time that is seen is in the top 50, which means that through the social networks, there's a difficulty in communicating. Now, for this reason, so human attention is uh, poor or weak, it has limits. And so what we manage to understand is communication is very limited. The question is how do we get around this? This is the idea. Well, I don't have the answer. But what I think is that the relationship between democracy and technology is necessary, which uh, I would like is that in the same way we say that, that the evolution of technology in, uh, in different fronts, uh, education, different industries, it has to give answers to the needs of democracy. That means that we have to create a greater environment for the digital economy, meaning that technologies have to know how to respond to the to challenges and needs uh, so that we can commemorate, in this case, in Portugal, the 100 years of the 25th of April with the quality that we want very quickly. So if today we we can, as is through artificial intelligence, uh, experience what is going to happen in 10 years' time, this is going to give us a capacity to react and communicate and process uh, uh, knowledge in a very different way. Meaning technology would be work for democracy. So, Miguel, as a professor, you do a lot of research on how technology is used and how you can get companies to be more profitable, sportsmen being better. Can technology, has, is technology being studied to be used in the best way possible in democracy? Are we leaving this, uh, uh, this technology? being used as a megaphone just to make noise and create revolution and declare a war. Once again, the answer is both things. There's a, a, a link to what has been, what Grassa just said, there are two things that we have here. That we have this technological transformation, this democracy, this public space, it reinforces the revolution that was occurring, that is the politics where emotional empathy is becoming more relevant and the, the, the rational part. Now, how are we going to incorporate elements that um, force us to rationalize the political process when uh, people are taking decisions in a more emotional way? Now, having mitigated this, we get to, can, can, the career, for example, employment is... Uh, or gives better results in elections, for example. And so the, the, the way technology is being used is also being used to, to improve democracy, the same way that uh, democracy increases the risk of fake news. Uh, democracy is creating instruments which allow the verification of information in real time. Journalists, uh, in some cases, and they're going to have more and more tools that are going to allow them to know and check whether the content uh, of a the discourse, a, a speech made by a politician that corresponds to uh, real data. Now, they believe more, as I said a while ago, they believe more in Facebook than a politician who has to uh, confirm the sources. And there's an ethics in technology, and sometimes this ethics is gone. And so we have to ask, why do they believe? Because it's quicker. They, they believe in this for two reasons. The, the good one is deeper, the loss of authority of these uh, intermediaries uh, um, in the media. 
in the political system, and as uh, citizens think that uh, the politicians are biased, uh, politicians as well, they tend to lose this confidence, and then uh, well, the the infam because information is all being valued in the same way. They say that the defenders of the Holocaust uh, in. Uh, the social network is the same as the scientist says because everything's the same. So the authority is lost, and the other dimension is the, the net, social networks who amplify the um, for, false ideas because uh, the informational cascades. So if I know this, uh, something that Grasa says is shared by many thousands of people, I give more credibility to it. There are more, so many people sharing this that it must be true. So in the, in the social networks, we can do this through uh, false accounts. Uh, and so Russia, in its information strategies, lose, uses this a lot. So the number of Twitter con uh, accounts uh, tweet uh, things. And so we have to limit these risks by identifying them. And the risk of, for example, when we think of acting, we often uh, think of regulating. Now, that is, if you look at uh, technologies of social network, a privileged space of freedom, whether there is a need or not, for more regulation, or is regu uh, regulations a danger? And you put an end to this freedom. Well, the digital space where we l live more than half of our life, uh, 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 meetings, uh, conferences, conferences were uh, permanently linked, uh, and so we live in a space where nobody. It, nobody controls anything, there's no governments, and so. And this is something which, in fact, needs uh, uh, certain regulation. And so. Uh, it needs to have uh, a co responsibility, co accountability. And which is difficult to account for this in the societies we live in because we live in a very individualistic uh, society. The way we live over these last decades, we're a very individualistic type of society. And so we need to counter this. If we don't understand that like companies, the state, to politicians, journalists, citizens uh, are all responsible and co-responsible or accountable for what's happening uh, to our democracies in the future, uh, we will never um, create a balance between what the digital economy needs. And as I said this morning, they, oh, it was talent, innovation, creativity must uh, uh, gr continue to grow and be something positive in our lives. But at the same time, we understand that there are risks. Uh, is we have to have ethics, a social aspect that's important. Everything must have a shared responsibility. Miguel, is it shared responsibility? Is that got to do with raising awareness? And on the other hand, the opponent, the terrorist, is not going to use these rules, is not going to have this uh, awareness. It's not part of his nature. And so how does one create a balance? Now, this tension is not new. <coughs> we know the democracy doesn't work without truth. The democracy that uh, people make their uh, political preferences on based on fake news is fake democracy. And so we have to use uh, pluralism. Pluralism is the ability to express different opinions in the public space. It's not, it's not the far west. We've always had uh, uh, regulations, and so uh, the media has to comply with certain um, 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 ethical criteria. And so the question is, how do we create an architecture of a new public space that exists in public uh, networks, social networks, that safeguard the same principles? 
and so I've made proposals uh, in this narration like a Portuguese researcher from Florence and I made a proposal that uh, the social networks should be obliged to open their code in order to allow competitive algorithms and so we are not per, per, uh, incarcerated in one single algorithm. And the same way I can use different uh, newspapers, I should be able to uh, choose for Twitter or Facebook uh, different algorithms. This is an evolution to bring an editorial process of a greater quality to social networks. This is kind of um, uh, one of the things that the rules Former rules for the media are, are difficult to transpose uh, to the, uh, the media nowadays, and so the, we have to think how we're transforming uh, the social networks and how we safeguard these uh, uh, principles. So we have two minutes, and since we're looking at uh, uh, the future, so my question is well, the future, even if it's just tomorrow, is it? Are things uh, looking rosy or not? As Miguel said, see, the answers can always be yes and uh, things can be excellent. I want to hear what you believe. John's asking us to behave as if we were in social media. Now I'm talking about the appeal. You talked about the appeal and the emotion. No, I want to see what you say. So I'm optimistic by nature. And I learnt over 22 years that technology helps us a lot. It is an excellent tool. It's a very important tool to get to people faster and to be able to uh, convey this empathy, as Miguel said, that is the, p the possibility uh, to uh, trans broadcast things through image, words. Everything has changed, and technology is a tool that allows us to have a closer connection with people. It is a tool that helps us, I believe, uh, fight the crisis, trust which is global, and the trust in politicians, the uh, judicial system, etc. But like uh, everything else, the tools are what we make of them. Miguel, same question. I made a book recently, and uh, one of the authors says the internet is going to, to, to um, uh, kill democracy. But I look at the history. If we look at the technical innovations, the case of uh, printing and the industrial revolution, stabilized the world but brought us a social state uh, to a certain extent. I think this is a, a problem of agency. So we have to have the perception that we, uh, uh, humans, who have to control technology and use it positively. We don't see our relationship with technology just as the addressees to to see what's going to be done with democracy. And so the future is uh, oh, tomorrow. And so we hope that tomorrow we can see whether that's the case. I would like to thank you both very much. And so we will left with some ideas.